Hello. So let's continue with our introduction here. So now we will look into the knowledge discovery process. So what you see here is a you know pretty commonly known data science project life cycle. It all starts with data collection, right? And then we will be busy with cleaning, preparing the data, and then we will explore the data, and then we will start creating different machine learning models. And then um, you know we need to validate those models as well, and then the uh, critical step is to deploy those models and make use of them so that they can benefit us in some way. And of course, as time passes, you know, new data will be collected by those applications and we can make use of those new data as well. And also, as things change, our models might uh, begin to operate in a not very ideal conditions because the data might be changing. So that's why this cycle will basically uh, help us to retrain the models with the newly collected data. In a linear way, it can also be shown like this at the bottom here. So an example here of, you know, um, basically what we just talked about is shown so we can gather data from various sources. Um, this can already be collected or we can go out and collect it ourselves. So things like the, right, the databases, Excel files, CSV files, text files. Uh, websites, lots of different places can uh, serve as a source for data. And then we will explore those data, uh, prepare those data, analyze those data, and then basically the phase where we start creating models um, is the one that we're going to focus in this class, which is machine learning, right? Trying different models, doing hyperparameter tuning um, so that we can optimize those models to the data. And then we deploy those models and the cycle continues like this. So this figure is taken from another book. It basically summarizes the same ideas in a slightly different way. But as you can see, the overall process is mostly similar. This is something I had created uh, before. Um, of course, one thing when we, when we create the models, we don't make use of all the data, but rather we separate it out in the training and testing um, because it's important to um, have that testing data to uh, see how good the models are doing, right? Um, and then we expect the new data from, you know, once we deploy it uh, to behave similar to this test data. So that's why we um, trust the outcome from the test data. If there's drastic changes from the real world, um, then basically our models won't work. So that's one of the things in machine learning we assume that things will stay similar to what we have in our training and testing data sets. That's why continuous improvement, you know, continuously checking the data is an important aspect of the machine learning process or the data mining process. From this figure, as you can see, uh, one of the important steps is data collection and preparation. It takes almost a quarter of the process, right? The model development and testing is also important. But again, the performance of your models will really depend on how good your uh, data is. Um, if your data is not good enough, if there is lots of noise, um, if there is not enough variables that can help the models in terms of identifying um, the problem and helping solve, to solve the problem, whether it's classification, regression, clustering, or whatever it may be, then your models won't be able to do good. So that's why you know, understanding the data, understanding the problem is very important. And then preparing your data accordingly is, is very important. All right. So in, in your machine learning models, no matter what you try, no matter what different models you try, how complex they are, and no matter how much hyperparameter you're tuning you did, if your models are still not good, basically you need, you, the only thing you can think of is going back to the data. Can you improve on the data? If that's all what you have and you can't do anything about it, well, basically that kind of shows that you can't do really much with that data. So, okay. So this is an important thing to always keep in mind. Like, for example, we all know of neural networks, deep learning. We always think that if you just apply those models to the data, 
um, no matter how you know difficult it might be, we'll still get good results um, because you know those are complex models. No, that's not the case. In many times, actually, um, you know, even with simpler models, you can achieve better as long as you have good data for that. So another kind of visual example here, let's say we have a kind of common data set in an image, uh, which is cats and dogs data, right? So we want to, you know, we want to classify these uh, from each other. So we start with exploring the data and let's say, you know, in this case, when you have images, you can either do image analysis and kind of image classification. What we do here is actually extract some data out of it and then we create tabular data and then we want to do some regular machine learning on it. So that's what's going on here. And this prepared data is like, for example, they get the RGB values out and some other things that you can extract from images and then you can use those features as, as you would like a normal tabular data. And then you can use it to basically train a model, right? And then uh, improve those models with the hyperparameter tuning. And then once you choose the best one, you can deploy the model, let's say in this case, onto your app, uh, onto your phone as an app. And then you can take a picture of uh, either a cat or dog and then the model, <coughs> the app will basically tell, hey, this is a dog or this is a cat. Um, of course, in this case, you know, since there's many other things that you can take picture of, maybe a third class would be like other, but then, you know, you will have to collect a few, quite a few images from that as well. So basically, um, maybe to overcome, to overcome such a problem, because, you know, once, if you just train your models with these two classes, if you take a picture of something, and if that's neither cat nor dog, then it will still classify it as either cat or dog based on the probability it's estimating it to be. So one thing maybe here could be like if the probability that it estimates is quite low, let's say low, I don't know, 0. I don't know, quite low, let's say 0 0.2, 0 0.3, whatever it might be, then, you know, classify it as other. So in that case, the model can't say anything about it. Um, and then, you know, it's uncertain, so it says, this isn't, I'm not sure whether this is a cat or dog, so I'll just say it's another thing. All right, so let's continue with the different paradigms of machine learning. So the, the three main areas, the paradigms of machine learning are supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. All right. So the main distinction between these two is between the supervised and unsupervised is that we have labeled data for supervised learning. So we can, the models can directly get some feedback from their train, uh, from their training. What does it mean? So, um, right. So if there is data and then there's the class label given, let's say this is class zero, class one, class one, whatever. So once the model starts learning, let's say given this input, it will predict it to be class zero but the actual label is one, so it can directly get feedback. It will learn that it is wrong. And then based on these inputs going through all the data, it will be able to update its weights, right? In general, the models will learn some weights. Think of this like the beta coefficients and the linear regression or logistic regression. So pretty much all the models are, you know, behave in a similar manner. So then they can update the weights. And when they are doing this, they have a cost function, right? So they are trying to minimize that cost function. The only thing they are able to do this because they know the labels. It can be a numeric label, like a continuous numeric value for regression or a class label like this, which is a factor, a uh, categorical value, right? So at the end, it's able to get feedback and then improve on it. The, the main difference from unsupervised learning is basically in unsupervised learning, there is no label. So there is data, but there is no label, right? So when there's data like this, what we can do now is we can learn from the you know, like different patterns from this data. We can do clustering. We can see basically get some insights from the data, but that's pretty much it. There's no, pre you know, direct feedback or anything like that. So that's why it's a bit harder to do unsupervised learning. Um, I mean, there's some methods when you do like clustering in order to improve your clusters, the number of clusters you have, but nonetheless, you don't have an exact label that you can really you know, compare your results to, right? So, you know, like at the end of the main goal in unsupervised learning is like to learn a bit more from the data. What can we extract from it? Like learning patterns. 
reinforcement learning is quite a bit different. There is no notion of labels here. There is the notion of uh, um, like you have um, certain states, you have certain players or agents in the system, and there's a certain goal you want to reach. So um, during each phase or during each turn or during each time point or, or at the end of a session, let's say, the agent, you, you analyze the agent, did it achieve its goal, did it succeed, did it fail, what happened through that process, which states did it go through, and at the end, you know, did it achieve something or not. So based on that, it will either get a reward or maybe some punishment, and based on that, it will learn its behavior and improve on its behavior, right? So that's in a gist how a reinforcement learning looks like. And as you can see, one of the common examples is actually in gaming, like let's say in Mario game, you know, the you start with Mario, which is untrained, which doesn't know anything. So maybe it starts walking left and right, jumps, it does this, does that. And then slowly it learns, right? It touches one of those creatures and then it dies. So it says, okay, it's bad to do that. So next time it tries not to touch it. Maybe in the next run, right? So let's say this is our little Mario here. Um, it learns that, okay, when it touches, directly on uh, one of those creatures it dies but then when it jumps on top of them actually those creatures die right so there's a new behavior it learns um so slowly slowly it will learn all these behavior like when it you know jumps um it learns how to jump you know um, that it should jump over these cliffs otherwise it will fall down and it will when it falls down it, it dies so again uh, be you know th those all those states and the outcomes are affecting the behavior of the agent. In this case, the agent is the Mario. And there's, of course, other agents, all those creatures, animals, those plants. Right? In Mario game, those are all the other agents. So there's an interaction between the agents. Um, the, there is the current state, the next state. There's probabilities happening. Um, so you can imagine after maybe 1,000 tries, maybe 10,000 tries, it will learn to pass through that first level. And then in the next level, it will learn some new things. And after many, many back and forth like this, it will be able to, you know, improve on its behavior. So in a way, actually, this, if you think about it, it's like how we learn as human beings, right? The baby, uh, when they see a, you know, when they touch, let's say, a teapot, it's hot, it learns, it cries, it hurts, and it learns not to touch it anymore. But then maybe some other time it touches it again, and actually it's cold. So then it maybe tries to distinguish between those two states. Like when is, when is it hot, when is it is it cold? Um, but in general, of course, once it gets hurt, the baby does not really wants to um, touch it, hopefully, uh, because um, that's kind of a very bad memory for it. Um, you know, in a way, you know, our life uh, is basically kind of a reinforcement learning, right? We have, we make mistakes and then we try to not to do them again because um, that's what learning really means. So in supervised learning, um, you see classification is one main example where we try to distinguish between two classes. And then regression is another one, another common approach, which is there is some numeric data. We want to fit a model through that best fits basically that data, like kind of a linear regression model, let's say in this case, which goes through the data with minimal um, error, right? So those are the two main areas. Uh, and in unsupervised learning, there's clustering. So we want to basically analyze our data and then see if there is some groups forming naturally. Kind of very similar to classification, as you can see. But here we have the labels. So the lab from the labels, we can learn a boundary that can separate the two classes or you know, two or more classes. But in clustering, there is no such label. So we just kind of look in a way of how the data is dispersed in an, um, in a f among the variables. So in a hyperplane. And then can we, you know, can we see cluster forming up? So if you think of in a three dimensional way or in a two dimensional way in this example here, you know, these look very similar. They are very close to each other. These are also similar and these are also similar. Now, of course, there's points, as you can see, that are kind of not f falling into any of the regions, any of the clusters. So then at the end, you, will, you can put them into the cluster they are close to, or they can be identified as outliers, maybe. So this is one way of identifying outliers. Uh, by using clustering, uh, which is another way. Density estimation, again, you look at the data, how it's, you know, if there is a much dense region in the data set where, where there's lots of points like this in the middle, then, you know, once you fit a model, a density model on this, it will probably look like this, right? So, kind of the probability density estimation. 
And another approach, uh, another field in unsupervised learning uh, that's commonly used is PCA, principal component and analysis, or dimensionality reduction. So that's also quite common. So just another example of supervised learning, cats and dogs, as we have seen before. So in this case, we are doing classification. Um, and unsupervised learning is for, um, given here, and this is kind of to show that, uh, I mean, this is pretty much valid in any data set. But especially for unsupervised learning, it can be really very subjective because on the attributes you choose, you can really get very, very different clusters. So let's say in this case, you know, based on the occupation, there's two clusters forming up. Uh, based on the sex, there's two clusters forming up here. And then um, you can come up with different ideas as well. Like what I realized from these pictures is that, okay, I see quite a, some, some blue color happening here. So if I use color as kind of my main ingredient in the clustering, I can say, okay, this, you know, this, 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 and maybe this one as well kind of forms one cluster, um, right? The, these red are kind of another cluster. Um, or maybe if I were to include like green as another one, so these two, actually Maggie would go there. Um, Right, that's another cluster there because it kind of looks green, but this will be kind of in between the blue and green because there's half blue, half green on this. So anyway, you get the idea. So based on the different inputs you use, uh, you can get, and uh, you know, quite different clusters there. The comparison between unsupervised and supervised shown here again. So, um, so the main thing again is about the label so um, we can have the same data set but in, in the in the supervised learning we should have the labels so let's say these are the pictures and somebody labeled it for us but in unsupervised learning we took the pictures but nobody labeled it so they have no labels yet all right now if the data is quite separable from each other then you know both classification and clustering can achieve quite very similar results so in this case it's quite the pictures are quite distinct from each other. As you can see, the cats are quite distinct from parrot, both in shape, the color and everything. So even if you didn't have any labels here, um, I think clustering would achieve a cluster with these two pictures and another cluster with these two pictures, right? Because they are quite distinct from each other. But of course, this is not many times the case. Uh, many times the data is much more um, overlapping each other and it's much harder to do clustering. All right, let's look at an example for regression. Let's say this is our the restaurant data set. You know, we want to predict the tip value, which is a numeric con continuous value. So in this case, we can apply a regression model to find a uh, model that can predict how much a tip, a tip uh, will be given based on the different inputs like total bill, the sex, smoker, date, time, and size of the table. Classification example, let's say this is our data set and we want to predict whether there is a disease or not based on 0, 1. So then we want to find the boundary that can separate the two classes. And these are the different inputs we are using. Unsupervised learning, let's say this is the, the wine data set. And let's say we don't know the wine type. So in, okay, in this case, the wine type is given for us. So we can do classification on this data set. But let's say it was hidden from us. It was not given. So that's why I'm hiding it there. So in this case, what we can do is we can do clustering by using these inputs and we can try to find you know from the data given can we find such clusters happening so as i said in reinforcement learning there's the agents there's they have different actions and reactions and outputs um, and then there's the state so based on the, all the interactions between these different components there is either a punishment or a reward at the end and then the model you know the uh, the reinforcement model will learn to improve on its behaviors. Some different supervised machine learning models are listed here. Uh, generalized linear models like linear regression, logistic regression, and different types of regression like um, uh, Poisson regression and so on. Supervised uh, vector machines, we have linear SVM, the RBF radial basis function, kernel, SVM, and so on. There's the neural network models, which is also called multilayer perceptrons. Or nowadays, we also have deep learning, which is much more deeper uh, neural networks, basically. Tree-based models or rule-based models, right, decision trees. Um, when we combine these decision trees, um, we can get ensemble models, which is a forest gradient boosting machine, and so on. 
Um, by the way, ensemble models can also achieve by combining different models, but commonly the symmetries are preferred. Graphical models, the Bayesian neural networks, uh, sorry, Bayesian networks and also Bayesian neural networks can be included here as well. Um, Instance-based learners are the k-nearest neighbors. That's another example there. So how does the learning work in machine learning? Um, there's different categorizations of the machine learning models. Okay, there's eager and lazy. There's batch versus online. There's parametric and non-parametric, and there's discriminative versus generative. So let's look at them and see what they do. Um, so in eager versus lazy, it's basically, uh, you know, like some models re really learn from the data. So they fit, the, you know, their, their models are fitted onto the training data. And then when new data comes in, the model will try to predict on the new data. Pretty much all the models fall into this category. Well, many models fall into this category, like logistic regression, linear regression, SVM, I don't know, decision trees, neural networks, right? So they, they all learn from the data. Lazy is a bit different. Lazy is um, basically there is no real training phase. The, the algorithm, basically there is a procedure for the algorithm on what to do on the data. Uh, but it doesn't learn anything from the training. So for these scenarios, there's only testing. Basically, when a new data point comes in, it just makes prediction on it. A very good example will be KNN, the K nearest neighbors, right? So in that case, there is data points in the system. And let's say these are the two different classes we have. Um, all right, there's the green ones as well. All right, so when you when the let me change this uh, the red color into something else. Let me make it yellow. Let me make it this way. Okay, so if these are the two different classes, all right. The idea of KNN says, okay, I'm going to look at the distance, and based on the k number of closest points, I am going to assign the new point to that class. What does it mean? So let's choose a new point, which is black. So the black point comes in right somewhere here. So let's say if I choose k equals to 3, it will find the three closest distances. Let's draw the distances in blue color. Okay, so they are very close. Let's say this one is the closest, followed by this one and then this one. All right. So let I mean, the distance is basically, you, you know, we can use different distance measures. Euclidean is an, Euclidean distance is one of the most common one. So let's say the distance from this point to this point is, you know, uh, 3, um, 4, and then 4.5. It doesn't really matter the distances. These are the closest points. So if I am choosing k equals to 3, that means I'm going to just look at the three closest neighbors. So that means then uh, there's two green and one yellow. So then this black point will be classified as green because a majority is green. Okay, now the question is, although I kind of visually kind of saw that these three points are closest to this black point in the middle, which is the new point that I'm trying to classify, how does the system know that these are the three closest points, right? Because the, the algorithm will not be able to look at the picture like this, like we did, and then decide on it. And um, another thing is that here, I assume actually, let me draw maybe the full thing, x1 and x2, there's only two dimensions, right? In the data weight, this means there's only two columns, right? And then there, the corresponding labels are given, etc. So, the, the the as I said, there's no training as you can see, right? There's just the distance that's going to be measured. So when a new data point comes in, the distance from this black point to every single point in the system is calculated. So the distance from um, Let's choose a pink color. So the distance from this black point to the green point is calculated. The distance from this black to the yellow is calculated. The distance from this black to this green point is calculated. And if you call this D1, D2, D3, D3, D4, you know, every distance is calculated and then they're being ranked and then they're being ordered. So let's say our blue distances were D5, I don't know, D8 and D9, 
So then based on the ranking, D9 is the closest one, D8, and then D5, right? So then what, what the next step is, okay, these are the closest three uh, the points based on the distances. What are their labels? This one is green. Um, this one is yellow. And this one is green. So that's why the calculus, based on the um, majority votes, the point, the black point will be, uh, you know, uh, assign the green label. So that's a lazy algorithm, right? There is no training. When a new point comes in, calculate distances, rank them, and then choose the uh, first k values. All right. Uh, can I delete this? Oh, actually, when I did this, everything disappeared. That's good. So um, another learning type is batch versus online batches. Basically, you collect the data and then you use it to make, um, you know, train your model and so on. Online is in new data sets keep coming in, new data points keeps coming in, and then you know the model tries to learn from them, and then those data points are discarded. So this is especially valid for very large data sources, like I don't know Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube kind of things where there's lots of data coming in. So you can't really collect them and make use of them. I mean, you can do it, but after a while, you know kind of the model will be a, we should be able to learn from the new coming data as is so that's kind of what we mean by online learning there parametric versus non-parametric so um it's basically in parametric learning the models you know there's some certain set of parameters that the model should learn so linear regression for example right we have we have beta zero plus beta one times x one plus beta 2 times x2 plus beta 3 times x3 plus and so on so all these x's are the variables we have and the model tries to learn these parameters so these are the parameters of the model and these are learned from the data right so there's some certain set of things that the model is trying to learn in this case for linear regression and logistic regression is the same thing it tries to learn these beta values which are which is the coefficients right um, For non-parametric models, there's no certain set of parameters that it tries to learn. The model really depends on the data. Based on the data, it will change its shape, it will change its you know, coefficients, and there's no certain set of things to fill in, basically. A good example for this would be decision trees. For example, in a decision tree, right, it starts from a node here, the parent node and then starts asking different questions and based on the um, answers, it goes into different branches. It can grow and grow like this, right? When you change the data a little bit, this tree that looks like this now can look very different. So in the new case, it might look something like this. Let's say, let's create a smaller one. Just for an example here, so let's say it will stop here. Okay, so as you can see, the data based on it, you know, and when I say change, it might be just a few rows. You can take them out, you can add a few more rows or something. You just make some small changes to the data. Well, while on the, you know, while on the, you know, data number one, so D1, it was the tree looked like this. On data number two, it will look like this. So as you can see, there is no certain number of parameters that it's learning. It's based on the data. It will change. Uh, the model will basically adapt to the data. So that's non-parametric models. Discriminative and generative models. So let's look at that. So the discriminative model is basically, you know, where the model is trying to learn a boundary between the two classes, as you can see here, right? So that's called discriminative model. So what we try to learn is PY given X. Pretty much, you know, the regression models, the SVM models, logistic regression kind of tries to do this in all network models and so on. The generative model is a bit different. So what it does, it basically looks at the data, fits distributions on the different classes. And then from those distributions, it tries to, you know, create this boundary. And then when new data point comes in, it will classify based on that. So. A generative model is a bit more complex because we first learn px given y, x is the data, y is the class. So we 
basically fit the distribution which is this blue um, area here and the red area here so two distributions are fit on the, the two classes here and then based on that we try to find py given x so this py given x is directly found in discriminant model in general model is found later so when a new data point comes in um, black point comes in here this cumulative model says this is my boundary if it is to the left anything to the left will be classified as blue anything to the right will be classified as red so this is to the left so then this point will be classified as blue that's it if it were here it will be classified as red that's it that's pretty simple um, what does the, the uh, generative model do so it, it first learns these distributions and then again uh, what it does it's basically when a new data point comes in let's say it's over here here it will first calculate the probability that it belongs to the blue class and it will also calculate the probability that this black point belongs to the red class okay so as you can see since it's closer to the blue area where there's the blue color underneath it the probability of being blue probability of um, being blue given x given that data point will be maybe let's say 0. Um, maybe 4 well since probability let's say uh, let's, let's make it 0. 0.6 and then the probability of this point being red given x given the data which is the black point so this is our x here is 0. 0.4 so then based on the probability value since this is larger it will be classified as blue Okay. If the point were to be here, as you can imagine, it will be classified as red, red, definitely red. The difference is that when it is here, let's say this one, the probability of being red is 0 0.55, um, let's say, right? When it is closer to the center of the red area, the probability of being red will be larger, maybe 0 0.7. When it is much closer, it will be much larger, 0 0.9. So here the system is much more certain that this is a red point, while here it's a bit less certain. And now we can see this white area, which is kind of in the between, that's where it's more tricky. Because now, really, if it is a bit closer to the blue line, or the blue area, then it will be classified as blue. If it is a bit closer to the red one, it will be classified as red. And the probabilities here will be very close to each other. Right, so we are talking about 0 0.51 and 0 0.49 kind of probabilities. But you get the idea. So um, that's how generative model works. So another thing I want to maybe show here is this, you know, here we are looking at the picture from above. So again, we have two, two axes here, x1 and x2, and the same thing for this one, x1, x1, and this is x2. If you, if you were to take this one, and just look at it from the you know from the front like from one dimension it will be basically looking like uh, two mountains one mountain is blue the other mountain is red it will be it will be a blue mountain to the left and then the red mountain to the right okay uh, i need to if i make the colors better then the red on the right the blue one is on the left okay right so this this point here which was first the edge that's somewhere here maybe so you can think of these points in this case maybe it's trees so there's a tree here from the distance you see a tree is this a blue tree or a red tree well since the problem of being blue is higher so this will be classified as blue this point which was at the very top of the red mountain is somewhere here Right? So you see this tree in the distance and you say, okay, this is definitely a red tree. This, these points, these trees in the valley is these guys here. So if it's slightly closer to the blue, you say it's a blue tree. If it's slightly closer to the red one, so this will be red and this will be blue on the left. All right, I hope you get the idea. So let's move on. Oh, okay, wait, I need to collect this. All right. So how does an ML algorithm learn? Um, sorry. OK. 
Okay, I don't know why this red thing doesn't move away. All right, good. It's gone. Um, okay. The so the algorithms they have, um, you know, the there is an optimization phase that happens behind um, behind the curtains that we don't see, right? So there's a cost function or a loss function. And in general, the algorithms try to minimize the loss value. So this happens by using different optimization techniques and optimization algorithms. All right. Um, and then once the error is minimized, the model returned is basically the most, you know, the best fitted model to the data, right? That's what we use in the next phase. So during the training, this is what happens. So the model tries to learn from the data. What we mean by learning is it tries to fit onto the data the best way possible. There's also hyperparameters. And now these things are not learned by the data. So hyperparameters are given to the model. Okay. So for example, we just did an example of KNN. This K value, we can choose different K values. We can choose one, we can choose two, three, four, hundred, whatever number of neighbors we want to look at right but then which one is better is three better or five better or 10 better or 30 better 50 better we don't know the model cannot learn this from the data these are given values so we give we will, what we will do is um what we mean by hyperparameter tuning to is basically where we try different k values for kn and then we will look at the validation score or the you know of the model so outside of the training, there will be the validation set or the testing set uh, in a way. And then we will look at how the performance is changing by using different K values. And then we will, we will, we will choose the K value that gives the least error, right, on that validation set. So that's the meaning behind hyperparameter tuning. Again, these are not learned from the data. These are given by us, the user. And um, this basically constitutes the main thing of hyperparameter tuning. All right, the parameters of the model, like the beta coefficients, the beta zero, beta one that we have seen before, are the ones that are being learned by the model. So the best beta values is the one that gives the least, uh, that gives the least error or the least loss or the least cost, cost in the training phase on the on the training data, right? So that's what being that's what the model is being optimized during that phase during the learning phase. Right? The optimization objective means we want to minimize the error and the optimization algorithm is basically each algorithm, uh, each of the models, the machine learning techniques are using different optimization algorithms to achieve this goal. So this is the goal and it uses different algorithms to achieve that goal. So some examples here is for... Um, <clears throat> For example, in naive Bayes algorithm, the uh, the objective is to maximize the posterior probabilities, right? If you if you know what genetic programming is, is basically kind of mimicking the idea of you know uh, evolution. There's a fitness function there, and it tries to maximize a fitness function. In reinforcement learning, what we talked about, there's the reward, and the system tries to maximize the total reward. In the scene tree models, there's something called entropy, right? And we try to maximize the information gain or we try to minimize this impurity, the entropy. So that's the idea there that's being used to optimize the models. The, minima, uh, the mean squared error is uh, used in linear regression uh, or, or pretty much you know many of the regression models. So the model tries to minimize this error, right? The cross entropy is used in logistic regression and neural networks, and, it, and the model tries to minimize it. So as you can see, sometimes we minimize. So when it is a cost and loss, we try to minimize. When it is a good thing, we, we try to maximize. So posterior probability, we try to maximize. Reward, we try to maximize. Fitness, we try to maximize, and so on. Or information gain, we try to maximize, which is basically the opposite of entropy. They, you know, they, they are doing the same thing. So we either minimize the entropy or maximize the information gain. In support vector machines, it's minimizing the hinge loss. All right. Some common optimization techniques is um, 
combinatorial search and greedy search and decision trees, unconstrained convex optimization in logistic regression, constrained convex optimization in support vector machines, the non-convex optimization, which is used in neural networks, and then constrained non-convex optimization, which is used in semi-adversarial networks. So it is just a gist of some uh, optimization techniques out there. Let's look at an example. So we have a logistic regression model we have chosen. Let's say we have some data. There is the class labels and it's a class, uh, you know, we can do classification on it. So it should be categorical. So let's say this is class one, this is class zero, class one, class one and so on. So we want to apply logistic regression on this data, see if we can, you know, separate the two uh, groups from each other, right? So we try to do that. Okay, so we chosen logistic regression. What is the optimization objective? It tries to minimize something. It tries to minimize the negative log likelihood or the binary cross entropy. So these are the same things, right? It tries to minimize, uh, minimize that. So it, that's the optimization objective. Again, many times we use ready packages, so we don't really what you know you know bother about these things but this is what it's being done when we say okay i trained the model you know the model has been trained on this data this is what's happening there so it tries to minimize the negative log likelihood or the binary cross entropy and once the model is done with its training right we, we have a trained model now a fitted model it's ready to use so what we do is we take another data set and then we can use this model on this new data set right and then you know it will make so the labels are not given of course in this case so it's like it, it's hidden from the model so it will make predictions it will say okay this is class one this is class one this is class zero class zero and so on and then we have the real labels too so they are ready uh, why but we didn't show it to the model because it's going to make predictions as here and then we, we now we can compare the predictions to the real uh, labels we already have and then we can evaluate the model so that's what this is about this is done by us at the very end once the model training is finished so we, then we can look at the misclassification error the classification accuracy the f1 score um, recall all kind of different metrics we will look into them more in the future another example linear regression in this case we are not classifying anymore we are trying to fit a line a a model that best fits the data so here the optimization objective we try to minimize is the mean squared error, all right? And once the model training is done, so let's say we have data points like this, right? And then it finds this line. What we can do is we can take that line. So this is our line now. And then based on new inputs, right? Um, so this is X1 and this is the Y by the way. Right, so that's why we can uh, we can show this slide like this. So there's only one single input here. So this is a simple linear regression. So when when this is, this is the input, our model will predict this is the value. When this is the input, our model will predict this as the value. When this is the input here, this is the prediction of the model. So basically, all the predictions will lie on this line, right? That's what it means to have a linear regression model. So based on the different inputs, we get these predictions and but we also, as I said, we already have the labels, which we didn't show. So let's say the actual value of this point was this yellow point here. The actual value, the Y value, right, the output value of this input was over here and this one was over here. So now these differences is basically the error of the model. So that's the mean squared error. We can calculate by these calculating the basically the distances from the prediction to the actual point, which will give us the mean squared error or the R squared value, which is another thing that shows how good the, the model fits these data points, right? There can, you can calculate R squared for both the training and also for the validation as well. So that can be done for both. So anyway, so this is how we can evaluate how the model is doing. Again, um, this is done after the model training is done, okay? After the fitting is done. All right. 